So good morning, everyone. Good morning. And this is Tuesday, uh, March 7th. Seven. Seven. Thank you. And uh, uh, Tuesday of the first week of Lent. We celebrated the first Sunday of Lent a couple of days ago. Now we're preparing for the second Sunday of Lent. And as I said in the, the church, we... Uh, went with Jesus into the desert, and now Jesus invites us up to the mountaintop for the transfiguration. And so let's, as we have at least begun to become accustomed to, let's begin with a prayer, and let's uh, pray the colic prayer for this coming Sunday's Mass. Let's pray it together. Oh God, oh God you, have you have commanded us to listen to your beloved Son. Be pleased, we pray, to nourish us inwardly by your word, that with spiritual sight may be pure, we may rejoice to behold your glory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And notice what we have prayed for is to be able to do what God commands us. And what God commands us, and it's very simple but difficult, to listen, to listen to God's beloved Son. And that then nourish, nourished by God's Word through His Son, who is the Word made flesh, uh, we may rejoice to behold God's glory. And when we speak of God's glory, we call to mind the great glory, you know, sort of like that image of the transfiguration. But if you'll also notice that those rays coming out from Jesus are in the form of a cross. And St. John's Gospel especially, and we are doing St. Matthew's this week, but St. John's Gospel especially, the glory of Jesus. Jesus is glorified in the cross, not in the resurrection. We'll be talking about that more and more, but he is glorified in his cross. The resurrection is left up to God to fulfill. But uh, So, you know, receiving the word of God made flesh and listening to this word, uh, we are hearing... God speaking to us. I just want to begin with a little, a little reflection that last night I watched a TED talk given by Evelyn Glennie. Does anybody know who Evelyn Glennie is? She is a Scottish percussionist. She plays all the percussion instruments, xylophone, marimba, uh, drums, etc., etc. Very famous, and she is deaf. And what she's talking about was music and how to hear music. Because you hear with all your senses. And her hearing, as we understand it, is profoundly impaired. But uh, she perceives music and the tonality of music and even the subtleties of music through all of her senses, especially the sense of touch. And I think that that's very much what we need to consider in listening, that we have to be uh, allow ourselves to listen completely. It's not just data that comes in uh, through sound waves, but it is uh, our whole being before God in a listening mode. And so I think that's something for us to keep in mind, especially this week, but also throughout all of Lent. Uh, a little bit more, we went into this last week, but a little review on the origin and history of Lent, and then we're going to get into the structure of Lent a little bit, and then we can get into today's readings. I think the key idea of Lent is fasting before feasting. Uh, to put it another way, if you're going to really enjoy a meal, you've got to get good and hungry. If you're on a diet, 
and you don't want to eat very much, what do you do? You do something before your meal to try to fill yourself up uh, so that you're not feeling hungry. And you don't fill yourself up with candy and snacks. You kind of fill yourself up. You know, they often recommend if you're dieting, drink water before the meal so that you don't feel the hunger so much. Uh, uh, that's what some of the uh, medications for dieting do, is kind of relieve the hunger before you eat. But if we're going to feast, and Easter is, of course, the feast, we want to be good and hungry in every way, not just physically, but good and hungry spiritually. Uh, and that's why fasting and the other pillars of Lent, almsgiving and prayer, uh, that, that's what they do. They prepare us to feast. They prepare us to allow God to bring us into participation in his life. And participation in his life means we let him fill us. We invite him in. And we imitate him by allowing ourselves to feel that we are overflowing into the lives of others. And that really is the idea of almsgiving. It is that you, even in your poverty, material poverty perhaps, uh, you are filled with God's gift to the point of um, overflowing, to the point of uh, giving out of abundance, even if in the eyes of the world that abundance is poor, is poverty. Nonetheless, uh, if we are participating in God's generosity, we realize that he's the source of abundance. Now, the structure of our Lent. Uh, currently, we have recovered one of the insights of the early church about Lent being preparation for baptism, preparation for initiation. That it's an extended retreat for those who are becoming Catholic Christians, those who are preparing for baptism. And usually when the early church speaks about baptism, and when we speak about baptism, we really mean the three sacraments of initiation. We mean baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, even though we have distorted them by separating them, at least in the case of adults in the Western church, now we know that the ideal is to have them, the three of them, celebrated as one sacrament, and the ideal time for initiation is uh, the Easter Vigil. I kind of look at, as I mentioned at the bottom there, that baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist uh, are seen as one sacrament, are kind of like three movements of a symphony. You know, the symphony is one, but it is in three movements. And you actually can enjoy the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth, for example, without the others. But for genuine completion of the experience of Beethoven's Fifth, you don't just stop at the first movement. You, uh, the first movement does need to be completed by the second and third, and in the case of most symphonies, the fourth. So when we're talking about sacraments, we talk about seven sacraments, and that is the teaching of the church. But it is overly simplistic. Uh, we can't just stop with the number seven. We need to realize that the first three sacraments actually are three movements of one sacrament, um, uh, incorporation into the life of Christ, um, uh, fullness of the life of Christ that we have received, oriented towards outward action, that's confirmation, and then the life of Christ being continually nourished and so um, in the Eucharist. So they are three movements of really one basic primal sacrament. The other four sacraments are really sacraments of Christian living, various aspects of Christian living, which you know you could go into each one, which we don't have time to do here. So the, the real um, primal sacrament 
baptism, confirmation, Eucharist celebrated at the uh, at the Easter vigil. Lent has become and always was really a period of purification. Purification is emptiness, is single heartedness, and enlightenment. Uh, uh, turning on the light so that we may see God's activity in our lives and in our world. So for us, I think Lent also can be a time and should be a time that focuses on this purification and enlightenment. And so we really, during Lent, and this is being emphasized in many parishes, we, the whole community, are walking with the elect. Those who were catechumens, and catechumens, uh, the basic idea of the catechumenate is it is an, an extended period of apprenticeship, of being mentored. That, I think, is the main function of a sponsor. The sponsor walks with the catechumen as a mentor. And learns together with the catechumen, and they share with each other uh, what it means to walk in faith. It's not just a one-way street, here, <laughs> I'll show you how to do it. It is, we will together explore the riches and the dimensions of faith. That period ends with the beginning of Lent. And after a successful catechumenate, a time of mentoring, a time of apprenticeship, is the rite of election. And right of election is actually uh, writing the uh, catechumens' names in a book and signifying that they are now the chosen ones to be baptized, to be received into the church through baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. And so these six weeks are a time, that time of kind of like a retreat. During those, for three Sundays, and that begins next Sunday, the following Sunday, and the Sunday after that, are the three scrutinies, and we'll be talking more about that. Scrutiny is not a nasty word. It sometimes seems to be a threatening or dangerous word, but part of it is looking at God, that it's an invitation to look at deeply, to, to scrutinize, and here we're playing with words a little bit, to scrutinize the inscrutable. Inscrutable comes from that word also. To peer deeply, to look deeply into the mystery of God and to look at ourselves as to how we are um, prepared and preparing, removing the obstacles to allow God to share his mystery with us or to engage us in the mystery. And then Easter Vigil, of course, the, the initiation. Uh, the structure, therefore, we've got these two Sundays of kind of preparation that we've been concentrating on, uh, uh, going into the desert and going to the mountaintop and what happens there. And then the next three Sundays are these uh, amazing extended stories of encounter with Jesus. The Samaritan woman, the man born blind, the raising of Lazarus. Uh, the fourth Sunday, a little more than halfway through Lent, is Laetare Sunday. We rejoice that uh, uh, Lent is uh, uh, on the downhill slope now, shall we say. And Laetare is the first word of the entrance antiphon in Latin for, uh, for that uh, uh, fourth Sunday. So rejoice. And then the sixth Sunday, is the palm and passion narratives, which have their own real grab value. And this year, year of Matthew, we go back to Matthew for both Palm Sunday, uh, the, the, the Palm Sunday procession, and, uh, and the passion. And uh, John's uh, passion narrative comes on Good Friday. That's Good Friday every year. And for, so now we have the transfiguration. The, Feast of the Transfiguration is on August 6th. What that really means is we celebrate the Transfiguration twice a year, on the second Sunday of Lent and on August 6th. And uh, Transfiguration, figure, figure refers to outward shape, not 
not a change of, of essence or substance like transubstantiation, no, but transfiguration that the real essence, the real what's inside comes out through outward appearance, through outward. And it's interesting, the, the Latin root of figure is fingere, which means to mold or to knead, as in bread. So, uh, or one very favorite place that I had back in the San Fernando Valley was I, I went through a period where I rejoiced in getting a therapeutic massage every couple of weeks, which really did help me go through some difficult times. And uh, the name of the place, it's no longer in existence, is Nice to be Needed. <laughs> needed you know. uh, so transfiguration, the Greek word for that is metamorphosis. So to change form, to change figure. Uh, um, in some Protestant traditions that have a similar lectionary to us, they have the transfiguration the Sunday before, yeah, before Ash Wednesday. OK. Do you know why? No. No. I, I don't. I probably will look that up. Or you may want to look that up and let me know. Now, how about this mountain of transfiguration? Interestingly, um, it's not mentioned. The, the, the actual place is not mentioned any, in any of the Gospels. Uh, traditionally, it's Mount Tabor, which is only about five miles uh, east of Nazareth. So it's between Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee. And it's on a plain. And it had strategic, in the Old Testament times, had both strategic military and religious significance. And you'll see that in a minute. Because Mount Tabor was one of the mountain peaks where they would light beacons to, uh, uh, to signal military maneuvers or to signal to the surrounding villages and that would probably include Nazareth, not that far away, and other places, uh, to signal the start of a holy day. So the Jewish holy days were actually, uh, there were a number of, of hills, mountains, tall hills like this, that uh, were highly <coughs> visible by the, around the, uh, the neighboring villages. And you see a village right here, too. And one off in the distance, another one. Uh, uh, they were highly visible, so they would light a fire on it to signify uh, a, the beginning of a holy day. So everybody knew that, okay, now we'd better behave. Um, now, the alternate location, which uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, before we started the presentation, uh, is Mount Hermon. Uh, this one is not so much in the, uh, in the uh, uh, broader tradition. There are a few traditions. Some of them go way back to maybe Mount Hermon. I'll tell why in a minute. But you know, certainly Mount Tabor is, because of its location, is the much easier one for tourists to visit. <laughs> so, uh, and you'll notice right at the top there, is a church. There's a couple of churches up there. That one, I believe, is a Franciscan church, the one with the, with the tower. Uh, the other possible one, which is, as you'll see, uh, is a very interesting sort of location. Mount Hermon is way up north, the border of Lebanon. The highest, it's actually the highest peak in that whole area. It's near Caesarea Philippi. You remember what happened in Caesarea Philippi, uh, the profession of faith of Peter and the giving to Peter the keys of the kingdom and the change of his name and so on. Transfiguration actually occurs, uh, according to at least one of the Gospels, six days after Peter's confession of faith at Caesarea Philippi. So there is some interesting reason for that location. Uh, 
because they're up there already. And as you'll see in just a moment, it's a long ways. It's not down near uh, Nazareth or the Sea of Galilee. Now, just one last little comment before I show you a couple of pictures. Uh, maybe it was deliberate that the location not be named by the Gospels in order to preserve the symbolic nature of this. That, you know, the reality is Jesus takes his disciples and us up to the mountaintop of his divinity and uh, shows the implication of his divinity. And we'll see that in just a minute. You know, it's not just to show off, hey, look at me, I'm God. I'm God, you know. It's uh, uh, in order to uh, tell us for us the implications of his divinity. It's not so much that we worship. It must be that we listen. And without listening, worship is meaningless. So listening has to come first. We've got to concentrate on what does it mean to truly listen to him. So that's what we will hear God say. Uh, this next slide shows the relationship. Mount Hermon is way, way up there at the borderlands of Lebanon, whereas Mount Tabor is down there by Nazareth. And uh, uh, those two red lines are actually uh, some of the disputed borderlands between uh, uh, Israel and Jordan. But, uh, now, here's Mount... Remember what Mount Tabor looked like. Here's Mount Hermon. Quite a difference. And a actually rather majestic sort of place. Uh, especially if somewhere around there, down in the valley, I presume, is uh, Caesarea Philippi, where what happened there? Well, Jesus gets the profession of faith from the apostles, vocalized by Peter, Simon Peter. He changes his name, gives him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, um, and then begins to, begins to talk about what? His coming death and, resur and resurrection. That he will go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, suffer, and be crucified, and rise again. And remember, at that point, Peter says, no, 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 this can't happen to you. And remember also that at that point, Jesus turns around to him, and he whom he had just called the rock, now he says, you're a stumbling block. Get behind me, Satan. So, you know, that's rather a bit of a comeuppance for Peter. And then it is very shortly after that. By the way, then, then Jesus says, you have to, uh, everybody who wants to follow me must take up his cross and follow. Then comes the transfiguration. So there's a certain value, I think, to seeing the uh, profession of faith of Peter and the transfiguration happening in the same place, especially with this you know, totally majestic um, mountain there. Okay. With those things in mind, let's go into the gospel. Who has the gospel? Joan, please. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up the high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Okay. Remember Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience, even though this comes into uh, the other Gospels too. But Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience who would immediately, they were Jewish Christians, who would immediately refer back to the Old Testament. And, uh, hey, that's what Moses did, went up on the high mountain. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. Moses, in Exodus 24, took Joshua. He didn't take Aaron. Remember, Aaron was the one who was deceived into making the golden calf. But he took Joshua with him. 
And in Exodus 24, it says that the cloud covered the mountain and that the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for, 60, for six days. And on the seventh day, God called Moses from the cloud. And then to the Israelites, the glory of God was seen as a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Moses entered into the midst of the cloud and went up the mountain. He was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So there comes our 40. Also, they would be thinking, the vision of Daniel the prophet, the ancient of days in the vision in Daniel 7, was his clothing was white as snow and the hair on his head like pure wool. The Ancient of Days, of course, that's God, God the Father. So it's very clear that, that uh, he is refer he's making reference to imagery, images that was already very much a part of their faith in, uh, in the story, the revelation from the Old Testament. Okay, moving along. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Okay, uh, Moses and Elijah, very clearly any Jew would see, okay, we've got the entire Old Testament, the law, the Torah, represented by Moses, and all of the prophets represented by the greatest of the prophets, Elijah, there with Jesus, speaking with him. Luke tells us that they were talking about Jesus' coming Passover, Jesus' coming Exodus in, in Jerusalem, the, his suffering and death and resurrection. Um, but the other Gospels don't tell us that. But, uh, but Moses and Elijah are very significant in Matthew because you've got the entirety of what God has spoken in the past represented right there with Jesus. So when you move on, let's think first about this. The entirety of the past is there on that mountaintop with Jesus. Now, Peter, good old Peter, says, ah, wonderful. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In other words, this is all we need. Let's stop right here. Let's stop right here. Um, the tents may well refer to, and this is what most commentators say, may well refer to the tabernacles, the tents, the, per the temporary dwellings during the sojourn through the desert during those 40 years, and the Feast of Tabernacles in which um, Orthodox Jews still build huts in the backyard and live in them through recalling the, the, these dwellings as the feast of God's presence and his care, a sign of, of they are moving out of their normal dwellings into this place of, um, of kind of deprivation so that God may fill them. Personally, in my humble estimation, I think what Peter was talking about was not the religious dimension of those tents in the Feast of Tabernacles so much as a military illusion. Their expectation of the Messiah would be that he would be a conquering hero to drive out the Romans and to put the people of Israel at the top of the heap rather than at the bottom of the heap and dominate everybody. That's what they wanted. Uh, that Israel should basically be able to control the entire world the way that Rome did. And so now, boy, Jesus, that's great. You're finally, you're finally revealing yourself as you are. Let's stay here. Let's set up military headquarters here. And, um, and from here, you can gather your army, and we'll be the generals, of course, and <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just conquer everybody. Actually, wasn't that the final temptation of Satan? Uh, the whole world will be yours if you worship me. Well, let's see what happens here. Well, While he, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. 
While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, the cloud, we've got the cloud up on the mountain, but then when Moses came down and set up the tent of meeting with the uh, with the Ark of the Covenant in it, the glory of the Lord filled that tent of meeting, that tabernacle, with a cloud. And then in 1 Kings, when the Temple of Solomon is dedicated and the Ark of the Covenant is moved into the temple, the Lord reveals his presence by, the, uh, by a cloud, by the cloud coming. So, that, too, would be in their minds when they see this cloud. And then from the cloud, very clearly, the voice of, of, uh, of God the Father uh, says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, remember the story of the baptism of Jesus. The cloud comes, and the voice says, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, in his baptism, God the Father is affirming the essence, the reality of Jesus, and therefore his mission. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, he's encouraging Jesus filled with the Spirit, to go forth because I affirm you, you are my beloved Son. Here, exactly the same sort of setting, except it's not down by the water, it's up uh, on the top of the mountain. God is now speaking to the disciples and therefore to us. This is my <coughs> beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, he's speaking with my voice. Now, back in Deuteronomy, in the law, chapter 18, Moses said, A prophet like me will the Lord your God raise up for you from among your own kindred. That is the one to whom you shall listen. And then a few verses later, as God saying, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, saying, speaking to Moses, from among their kindred, and will put my words into the mouth of this prophet. So that is what God is referring back to. The roots of that are in the Old Testament. Now, clearly, Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Please? When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. When throughout the Old Testament, and I guess there's something of human nature here, uh, whenever you're in the presence of God, you're going to fall down. And so they fell down. Everybody in the Old Testament and experiencing the presence of God, they fell down. They, they prostrated themselves. And how much of that was a voluntary action of, of uh, abjection and uh, worship, and how much of that was, uh, was, was an action out of fear is an, an interesting question. But Jesus then touched them. The Word of God touched them physically. He communicated himself by touch. And what does the word of God say? Do not fear. Rise up. Don't be abject. Rise up and do not be afraid. And so when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. Now, Interestingly, Peter had wanted to stay there the way that Jesus was in all that glory. 
and all they saw now was Jesus as they had seen him. All that God had meant in past revelation, all that, that God had done for his people is now summed up in Jesus, who is standing there like one of us, saying, get up, don't be afraid. So I think that, too, is a message for us. So they came down. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Why the secrecy? Because it's only in the light of Jesus' death and resurrection that the meaning of his life and mission can be truly understood. And it's important to see it's not in the light of the resurrection and, oh, that death stuff, well, that's, uh, it's nice to have that over and done with. But the meaning of Jesus' mission is that he embraced the absolute dregs of our human condition. In other words, God didn't send Jesus as his word to sort of uh, lift us up sort of like on a string. Uh, you know, here, here's, here's a safety line. Now uh, catch hold of it and I'll pull you up. No. God's love became so much one with us that he went down to the bottom. And I think that this is, uh, this is something that without understanding, God's descent into the depths of human depravity as, as the victim, as the one to whom uh, Satan, through human instrumentality, did his worst to him, that he participated in the worst that we can do to one another, and it's from below, not from above, it's from below that he lifts us out of it. So, if his glory is revealed prematurely, the reaction is going to be like Peter's. Oh boy, it's all finally here. Now we can relax, and Jesus is in charge, God's in charge, and okay, now God, what are you going to do for us? You know, what's your next act going to be? You know, that sort of thing. And that's completely, completely <coughs> missing the point of, um, of how God saves us, how God works with us. He gets down, down and dirty. Well, than we should too, in some way. Okay, first reading. We have Abra Abram being called out of his homeland, or actually out of Haran, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, this, in chapter 12 of Genesis, uh, Abram is being called and given a promise, but it is not yet the covenant. It's not yet the covenant that God made with Abraham. That takes place in chapter 17. That's the time when Abraham and Sarah's names were changed. And you know, that's always puzzled me, so I thought I'd look into that a little bit more. And it might be worth taking a couple of minutes to think about that name change from Abram to Abraham and from Sarai to Sarah. In both instances, one single letter is added, and that's the ha, the H sound. Now, Abram, av, means father, and ram means great or high. So basically, Avram. Avram is the great father, the high father. At the point of the covenant, God changed his name to Abraham. And that ha universalizes it. So it's not just the great father of a great family. It's the great universal father of all people. That's the significance of the ha being added to Avram. 
the name Abram. So Abram to Abraham, we might say, ah, you know, what difference does an H make? Well, it, ma it makes an H of a lot of difference. Uh, it goes from particular to universal. Sarah, the same way, except it's pronounced a little bit differently, at least in English. Uh, probably in Hebrew, and I don't know Hebrew, so I'm just guessing, but Sarai means my princess, referring to the princess of a single family. In other words, if Abram is the father of that family, Sarai is the princess of the family, um, the mother of the family, shall we say, the, the heart of the family. Um, and that's related, actually, to the Persian Arabic word for palace or large dwelling or household. For example, if you visit the Middle East, as I was in Turkey for a good number of times, we visit a number of places called caravanserais. Caravanserai was a Motel 6 for camels. Uh, it was a place on the caravan route, the Silk Road, where after a day of travel, there was you could have nights lodging. Your camels would be taken care of. Your uh, your uh, uh, various uh, people traveling with you would have their their rooms. You could get a nice shower and uh, a good breakfast and just watch over your money and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, they called them caravanserai. So, so sarai for referring to a person would really be sort of like the mother or the princess of the household. Well, you add the ha, and probably it was pronounced with a ha, sarach, or saracha, I don't know. Uh, that makes it universal princess, the princess of all people. So the one who is the uh, heart origin of all peoples. So that's the significance of that name change. Abraham, Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarai. I'm going to be tested on this. Um, so in this reading, we have the call and the journey of Abraham, or Abram, not yet the covenant, but a promise, a promise. The covenant, and here's a difference. The promise is God saying, I will do such and such for you, and we'll hear that. The uh, covenant requires reciprocity. I will do such and such, but you must keep my covenant, and the sign of that covenant is circumcision. Ouch. And uh, so it requires reciprocity. I will do such and so, but you must do your part also. That's the covenant. Now, Ur of the Chaldees, which is where J Abraham came from. Where is it? Well, generally it's seen in southern Mesopotamia, which is southern Iraq today. There is another ancient tradition that puts it in Edessa, which is now Shan Lurfa in southern central Turkey. Uh, and I have to say, I'm when the Syrian war started, I missed my opportunity to go to San Leorfa and to actually visit that place, which I think has good tradition behind it as being the original, the birthplace of Abraham. Now, see the difference in those two places. Uh, Ur is generally regarded as down there in Sumer, uh, south of Babylon on the Euphrates River, that uh, uh, Terah and his uh, family, they went up to Haran and um, stayed there. Terah died there, and then Abram was called out of there into Canaan. And that goes down into Egypt because there were a couple of times that, uh, that Abraham went down to Egypt too. That's when he passed his wife off as, as his sister, so that the pharaoh, the pharaoh who would desire her wouldn't kill him. And so he sort of prostituted his wife. Um, you know, there's, there's some interesting stuff in our heritage. Uh, here is what that ore now looks like. And there's partially reconstructed a ziggurat 
which would have been kind of a large pyramidal tower uh, at that time. But there isn't much there. There certainly is no modern city right at that point. And uh, 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 some excavation. And I think once things settle down there, there'll probably be more excavation in that whole area. The other candidate for Ur of the Chaldees, as I mentioned, was Urfa or Adessa, now uh, Shanli Orfa in Turkey, that would have been a short distance down to Haran, not this long distance from down here. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's anybody's guess, actually. Both traditions are, uh, are alive. This is what Shanli Orfa looks like, however. Um, much nicer place. <laughs> this is what's called the Pool of Abraham, and there are sacred fish in there, and it's a place that is revered both by Muslims, Jews, and Christians uh, as being the birthplace of Abraham. So, now let's go into reading from Genesis. Who has it? The Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from the land of your kinfolk, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Okay, now remember, that's Haran. That's not, uh, that's not Ur. They had already moved from Ur, wherever that is, to Haran. And now, the land that I will show you is Canaan. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who curse you. Notice that God is making a promise, and he's not conditioning it on anything. He's calling him forth into a new land, and then promising that he will do this for him, and that he will be a blessing to all people. And the communities of the earth shall find a blessing in you, Abram went as the Lord directed him. So what we have there is uh, God's call with a promise and faith and obedience as a preparation for the covenant. The covenant actually takes place in Genesis 17, and this is Genesis 12. Now, the second reading, and we'll be going through this fairly quickly, is uh, from 2 Timothy. It's a very short reading. Paul's second letter to Timothy. This was probably the very last thing that is that we have handed down to us that Paul wrote. And it's sort of a last will and testament that he's leaving. And it's rather sad because Paul was feeling the weight at that time. If you read 2 Timothy, he's feeling the weight of rejection. He's almost feeling the weight of failure. Um, he seemed to be alone. Nobody was standing up for him. Nobody was taking his side. He may well have written it from Rome, where he may have been in prison. And uh, he's writing to Timothy, who was perhaps his, his fondest uh, uh, disciple, apprentice. And uh, he had left him as the young bishop, the young overseer of the church of Ephesus. And he's reflecting on his own life, that God's call to serve the gospel isn't easy, that there's going to be op opposition and temptation to compromise. So this is a little bit of the introduction to that letter to Timothy, and who has it? Okay. Beloved, bear your share of hardship for the gospel, in the strength that comes from God. Go ahead. He saved us and called us to a holy life, not according to our works, but according to his own design. And the grace bestowed on us in Christ Jesus before time began but now made manifest 
to the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now something very interesting is happening here. Um, throughout most of the year, in ordinary time, uh, the second reading, usually from a letter of Paul or one of the other letters of the New Testament, is chosen independently of the gospel and the first reading. The gospel sets the theme. The first reading in some way corresponds to it. And, oh yeah, we're getting the second reading in too because we've got to get... get uh, We've got to get through Paul. Uh, in Lent and in the major seasons, all three of them are chosen for that uh, for the theme. So, as we had God calling Abraham to a new land, now Paul is reflecting on God in Christ calling us to new life and reflecting on the implications of that. And it's God taking the initiative. He simply asks our response, our obedience uh, to his initiative. So that brings us pretty much to the end of our uh, this coming Sunday. The next three Sundays are going to be those big three scrutiny gospels, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, the man born blind, and the raising of Lazarus. They are all from John. Matthew governs this year, but these three Sundays in Lent and Easter are really governed by John. So that's what we will be uh, dealing with for the next uh, few, uh, three weeks. And then will come the Passion and Easter, and we can say the A word again. So thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you all.